So, at your pleasure, sir. Do you want to wait for them or get started? Well, I think the only one we're waiting on is Tom, but we know soon he's going to be about a half hour late. Well, then let's uh, call this to order at uh, 433. I <laughs> remember how to run with how I got around this. Um, so is the roll call. Do we actually, because we don't have the placard, do we want to go around the table and we start sounds pretty good? Let's, uh, you know? let's do that for fun. Okay. Oh, well, I'm Brighton. Um, I'm the chair now. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, I've been on the board for since 2016 and been a long for about a decade in local city. I'm Callie Cordova. This is my first in person meeting, so I'm excited to actually see people. Uh, I'm Sheila Conner. I'm not a member of the board. I'm recording this on behalf of Longmont Public Radio. No, not Longmont Public Radio. <laughs> Longmont. Public media. Okay. Uh, Rhea Moriarty, um, in the, like, the vice chair of the board, um, and been on the board for three years. Is that three years? <laughs> well, I'm Dale Bernard. Um, I'm the one that makes the motion all the time. <laughs> That's my job. Um, no, and I've been on the board, I've just got reappointed to my second board. Katie McDonald, this is my second board meeting. <laughs> Eric Mason, I'm the curator of history here at the museum. Well, maybe the senator of the museum is present. I'm Joanne McCoy, executive assistant, and I'm also your board secretary. Yay, thank you. And I'm the manager, the director at the museums. Eric, have a question for you. Is there any way that we can turn that off while we're there? Nope. So everybody's going to have to kind of yell a little bit yes. through this, um, especially so we can capture our voices on tape. <laughs> so we're missing, at the moment, Tom Kurtz and our liaison, uh, Susie, who should be Joining us shortly. Okay, next up is uh, public invite to be heard. Very quiet, very yes. And now the approval of the minutes. Um, has everyone had a chance to look over the minutes from the last uh, meeting? And we need a motion to accept the minutes. Do we have a second? I think we should come and then go in and do something. I mean, you know, two pages. I, we must have been chatting last night. <laughs> and it was very interesting and dynamic in the presentation, and I hated to leave anything out. <laughs> I had to miss it, and it's like I was right there. <laughs> Great, well, we'll move on to the session now. All right, so, we uh, have the succession packet, since we don't have the PowerPoint on screen. That's the screen. There you go, Dale. Got it. Do you have one? Yep, we're good. So, the first one we have up is 721.032. Uh, this is a collection from a family with a lot of Walmart uh, history connections. Uh, Nick Montgomery Ham collection, if you're familiar with uh, Jim Ham Pond. That's, uh, uh, Dr. Hassan of uh, Emma Allah and uh, involved in this, and it was her mother and grandmother that addressed this. 
Uh, the assembly is a little hard to see here, but it does have quite a number of uh, good photographs, uh, including uh, the one for the green area. We'll get that oh. here. <laughs> And um, a number of uh, letters and other articles as well. Uh, questions on that? I'll move to 2021 uh, 3 So this continues uh, the acquisition. Related to a long one on Christie exhibit, which is uh, not in fact, this is a photo of the display case uh, that has the object. Um, Intermountain Railway Company is a long company that uh, designs model railroad cars, and they donated 18 of them to the museum for the exhibit. Uh, it was a local company, local. Uh, we have uh, this is sort of a summary of what they gave us. They, all, they gave us many pages of descriptions of exactly what all of this is. I believe. Uh, I didn't have to go to, to, uh, to visit them or draft something. I recollect the most of the address. So this is a small book, uh, hard to see, but it's, it's less than 100 pages, uh, that was sent to us by Van Graham, uh, astronaut from Long uh, Since he produced it basically just for his family, so normally we would not accept a uh, mass-produced book, uh, you know, like supposed to be acquired, but in this case, it's such a book that I think it's to be accepted. Into the collection. That's basically his, his reminiscences of uh, this time. Was his family also here in Long Island? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like, he goes back a little bit before they came to Long Island, but his uh, 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 parents uh, grew up here. And, this came out of the one on fifty exhibit, although it was acquired after the exhibit was already done. Uh, but uh, because we had reached out to uh, Rita Lou. Uh, and the uh, person in charge of a uh, tiny New Year celebration in Long Island. Um, and to try and find out a little bit more about that celebration and include a photograph of her at the celebration in Long Island. So, uh, would you be interested in a dress that I can uh, So, this was for the 10th anniversary of the tiny New Year, so this is uh, kind of the last. One before the summer before COVID. And interestingly enough, it's actually designed uh, by one who is also from the area. I'll motion to approve all of the exemptions. I'll second. Great. Uh, raise your hand uh, for yes. Okay. 
minutes. Passes unanimously. I'll just add that. Uh, the opening reception, which some of you were in, is um, Rita was there, and I think just beamed with pride the whole night long. So those are really warm, fuzzy kinds of things to be. Okay, on to the director's board. Um, so you guys may have heard that we are, we got a new um, masking order for kids, anybody older than two, within um, anything that's a camp-like setting. So that doesn't impact us immediately, but it will impact us uh, as we get into the fall with our um, uh, kids programs, discovery days, and maybe by that point there'll be more. We'll see. And so it seems to be changing every single day. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm fogging up with my glasses and I can't see without them, so I'll try to get through this. Um, we should, I, in fact, we, I have the, the latest Ascenda Architects um, report is in my inbox right now, so um, we'll, we've got the plans for that um, pretty well wrapped up, and so maybe we'll try to put that on the agenda for next month for you guys to review the, um, the drawings that we got from the Sense of Architect for our master development plan. And keep in mind that it's really, um, as we were talking about last time, these are still very much conceptual drawings. If and when we get to the place that we get into um, schematics, I have to remember the terminology, um, then there's still likely a lot of ch chance that those could change. Um, but we do have the initial uh, drawings for that. So that's super exciting to think about the future growth at the museum. Um, you probably know too that we, um, through the work that you all did, we, the uh, land acknowledgement statement was actually adopted by city council. And the thing that ended up happening, which was interesting, is that the mayor was actually really opinionated about how we used the statement. He, he accepted it and uh, voted to adopt it, but he feels really strongly that we don't use it at every event, that by using it constantly, that we actually take some of the meaning away from the statement. So we will be talking about it at our staff retreat next week to try to just understand for ourselves what that means. Um, because our job really is not to create policy, but to follow policy from city council. And so we need to figure out amongst ourselves how we're going to end up using the statement. But it did pass the, the city council, so that I think that's a really big deal. And thank you all for your help in getting that on the agenda. That was a great, a great um, accomplishment for the museum. As I just mentioned, we're going to be having a staff retreat next week, and so we're going to be talking about really all of those things that we've been up to lately, which is the interpretive plan, the master development plan, um, the work that we've been doing with um, diversity and inclusivity work, um, what our lives might look like if we do get a new building, what kind of staffing we might need in that case, what kind of budget we need to be looking for in that case. So a lot of planning work is going to be happening um, during those meetings. Um, and then I include there that the Performing Arts Center feasibility study is still on the radar. Um, you all may remember that the when the uh, consultant presented at City Council um, about the feasibility of a performing arts center. The direction from city council was for staff to figure out how to make it happen. Um, and so I'm involved in those conversations um, because there's a lot of things to figure out. And so we're gonna be doing what I call feasibility 2.0. So we'll, I'll, I'll keep you updated on that. But, but just to maybe backtrack a little bit, but, um, in that feasibility study, there was a phase one and a phase two that the consultants recommended. 
and that's why we included a 500 seat facility in the early conversations of our master development plan at the museum is that that was the phase two that they had recommended um, and so we were trying to see if there was any way that we could help decrease the cost of the big performing arts center by taking on that phase two but it didn't it didn't make any sense. I mean, the, the data that we were able to figure out in terms of the number of parking spots and the number, the amount of money and the square footage, all of those things just culminated in a conclusion that it didn't make any sense for us to have that kind of big seat facility happens. So we weren't able to do that, which is fine. I think it's good to have done the investigation and it's good to have a conclusion on that. Um, as you all know, we have um, our new uh, development um, director is working like a dog. She has been um, writing grants like crazy and she also organized our Long Island 150 um, opening, which I think was a big success. And thank you for those that were in attendance. Um, there was music and Eric had the best um, outfit of everyone who showed up. It was really fun. And I, I just have to say, like, I felt like people at that event were just so happy and it was really, really heartwarming. And I, you know, like, to see people's faces was just great. It was, it was a very fun night. Um, she's also working on, she just submitted yesterday, an NEA grant um, in partnership that we're working on with Emoca. And if we get that one, it's $100,000 for that partnership. Next week is, um, a America Recovery Act grant, and so we're hoping to do a new position with that um, proposal. And then we're also working on a Colorado Sustaining the Humanities, which is also rescue money. Um, and that one is a much lower amount of money, so um, for that one, we're just going to look at like supplies and things like that. There is a lot of money out there right now because of all of these rescue plan. Um, programs that are happening and we're trying our best to take advantage of all of them the um, and so it's just good timing with my neighborhood board that we're able to do this because otherwise we would never be able to do this but that's all she's been doing she hasn't done anything else so it's good good ground you know uh, we've got the uh, fall newsletter which is going to be hitting the mailboxes really soon so you'll be able to see exactly what we're all up to and that um, publication and so we've got lots of things going on. We have made plans as if the Delta variant isn't going to impact us. Um, we will see if that ends up happening a lot. You know, if, if in fact things shut down like they did before, then a lot of these things will go back online. We've been through the drill, we know what to do now. Um, but right now, we're still planning on having in-person programs, the art and search, the uh, auditorium programs, the several days, all of those things. So, pressure group. So that's going to happen because I think everybody is interested in being out into the world. Um, we've also got a lot of marketing going on for our Long Island 150 exhibition. Um, the theater's bus shelter is kind of um, a, a typical plan for us. Um, to, in order to get the word out for the new exhibit, so you can kind of get a sense of that scope of marketing and pictures included in there of the banners. A um, couple of uh, links to different um, news articles that we've been part of, which are always good to have. Uh, we usually get really good coverage with the Times Hall and the Long Island Theater, so it's nice. Um, and then we also recently, you know, we launched the um, additional historic Long Island tours on our virtual app. Um, and so we already have the walking tour that Eric put together that basically we just um, translated the content that he already had to the app. And then now we've added one on the history of um, the Latino community and one on the history of women in Long Island. And so we issued a press release and got a couple of stories about that as well. And then we've got a new media partnership with the Long Island Leader. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll, have, we'll be doing some digital advertising and things like that um, so that we're able to really get some new leverage that way. And then, um, as you know, or being of the um, 
KGNU is also one of our media sponsors, so we've got to have us that. Summer camp in the education department there um, ended in July, and there were a lot of returning campers. Um, and it was super successful this year. I think that what we saw is that people really were itching to get out. And so our summer camps did very well. Basically, we were, when we started our planning, we half the number of people in the summer camps thinking that we were going to be indoors and virtually distanced. And then as things changed, we realized that we could have more people, but we would need to do things outdoors. Um, and so we were able to adapt and we added the number of people that we were able to have in each of those camps. So we did way better than we projected that we were going to do in summer camps because of the changes that happened. From the time that we had to do the planning until the time that we were executing the actual events, which we've just gotten good at. Um, Fall Discovery Days kick off September the 1st, and again, that's going to be in person, so hopefully we'll be able to um, continue with that. And we've got some scholarships available. I have a request of all of you, which is that we did some um, uh, evaluation at the end of our summer camps, and one of the questions that was on that evaluation is what's about the scholarships, and apparently got feedback that not a lot of people knew about the scholarships. So if any of you know anybody who might be interested in summer camps, Discovery Days, Discovery, yeah, the Discovery Days and the summer camps, we do have scholarships available for those. And so please help us share the word um, for anybody who might be interested in a scholarship. We've got money to spend, so there's no reason not to apply for it. Um, day of the Dead stuff is really kicking into high gear at this point, now that we're, we've got summer camps behind us. Um, we've got the exhibit opening uh, plan for October the 9th, um, and that's when the festival is going to be as well. Um, School tours are going to be kicking back in, hopefully. I think as long as we're masked at this point, we'll be able to do those. It's just um, a lot of that is going to have to do with the schools because the transportation piece can be a challenge. And what we, the feedback that we got last year, even, is that it was, it was too much for teachers to take on. Um, so we'll see if we get a lot of inquiries at the school board this year. I think we already have one on the books, um, but I think, you know, teachers are kind of tapped at this point, so we'll see how that, uh, how that pans out. Um, and then of course, following these requirements, so we'll see how it all affects us on the clock. Yeah, do you want to do the collection section? Mm. So basically, um, the most of the last month is one of the most important And so, in that, and I hope you've had a chance to check it out. So, you can ask for a question. And then also, uh, I'll be interviewing my master's to the first month to see a type. Exhibits was much the same. <laughs> they were all Longmont 150 all the time. Um, yeah, that was that exhibit. I mean, when you go to look at it, you'll see that there's there's a lot of collections in it, um, but there's also a lot of design, um, which requires a lot of labor. So um, we, that was that was a very labor intensive <laughs> exhibition. So it was very cool to pull off. Um, and we also have, in addition to what's at the museum. With satellite um, uh, exhibits at um, the Rec Center, the Senior Center, and the Civic Center. So it talks, it's promoting it, but also telling some more specific stories of those locations. Um, so uh, the Impressionism um, works went back to the doors without incident, which is what we like to see. Um, they installed Wong 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 
And then you see the list of things there for the auditorium programs, um, the summer concerts, I think were really well attended. Um, we were trying to keep tabs on the number of people that were out in the courtyard. So unlike years past, we were actually taking um, reservations. They were still free, but you had to make a reservation for it. And so we were um, hovering around 250 or so for almost all of those concerts and our and I think the half count there is about 250. So they did quite well. Um, over 1,600 people. And then more, we did a live stream as well, so more online. And a list of more things coming up. I'll let you go to that. We did have um, a large turnout for the final phase of enduring impression, so that was really great. I'm glad that we were able to get that in um, when we were all in the clear for a while, but to keep people in for that. We had um, a total of 1,797 guests from July 1 to July 17th, so that's a big number for us. We had 145 visitors on the free Saturday. 325 people attended the Longmont 150 opening reception, I think, which was a really good number. I felt like it was more than that. I felt more than that to me. But that's still a good thing. Um, and there was uh, gift shop sales have seen some, some quick numbers lately. The night of the opening, I think we had a $2,000 day. So that was a, a really, really good day for us. Um, so just over 4,000 for the whole month of July. And then we have 60 membership renewals um, or sales and two giving club memberships sold in July. So that's also good for us. Um, we've got a couple of new front desk people. I think um, we saw some attrition over the course of the pandemic. And now that we're really back in, in full go, we hired some people and hired some bartenders as well. And hopefully it'll all work out because we've got some busy September um, rentals are coming up, so that'll be good to have everybody back in the, in the mode. Um, in hard public places, we've got um, we moved the Blue Mile by um, Lake Armando Alvarez to the library for the reopening. Um, the response has been awesome as the image inspired the original Chicano Colorado colony flag. Um, we welcome, they welcomed two new commissioners onto their team, just as we did with the um, advisory board. Um, and then we, they also started the, an audit of the AIP web pages and content. Um, and then Angela is working with communications to really get that up and running um, so that people can search for where the locations are on the city map for those hard public places um, installations. And we've got September the 11th, the Art Walk event, which is going to be kind of the big city celebration for the 150th anniversary. Um, and so AIPB is really going to be a big presence there. And you're going to be doing something too. Are you at the AIPB table? Uh, that's something figured out. Uh, well, I will be opening a time capsule that will feel for the 125th anniversary celebration. We dug it out of both of the places in the city center. So, one more plug that's actually not on here um, we are down advisory board members. So the next appointment is going to be December, is that correct? Right. So we'll start recruiting in October for appointments to actually start in January. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we're recruiting in October, appointments in January. If you have any friends or colleagues, family that you could find it enjoy the work that we do, um, I really encourage you to ask them to apply because um, we are down the members of this point and um, we need more people. That's it for the report. Does anybody have any questions for me? Um, I'm just curious on your staff retreat. Are you guys closing for those days so all staff are, are attending or is it? In the, in the best of all possible world we would do that but we just really don't have the 
ability to do that. So our front desk staff will be at the museum and we'll all be going to the innovation center actually to keep you our staff energy. So, so then they'll just need to be a lot of communications back to our front desk staff. Got it. Yeah. And then the other thing that this occurred to me um, because of the work that I do, yeah. um, with the, all of the grants that you're applying for, you mentioned that you're in one of them, you're hoping to use that for a new position. Uh -huh. um, with other grants and with that one, are you finding yourself looking to create new positions or programs as opposed to going for operational grants or are there operational grants available that you don't have to create something new in order to apply for them? That's an excellent question. So, the one that we're doing for the position would be used for anything. I have never seen a grant guidelines that are this flexible ever in my life. But the reason I'm focusing on that position is that staff is our most urgent need. And so being able to use it for our most urgent need feels like a who, you know what I mean? It's also a two year grant, which most of these others aren't. In fact, most of these others, you have to spend the money by the end of this year. Um, and so the idea is that we would do this as a two-year term-limited position and then be able to find the money in those two years to continue the position. So that's the kind of rationale behind that one. For the others, really what we're doing is, is not creating anything, but to basically just shift where, 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 how we're funding. So for instance, one of the ones I'm applying for right now is educational supplies. And it's only, I think, a $20,000 grant, so you know, not enough money really to impact anything else, but we definitely can change the way that we're able to, to fund with things that we buy out of the um, And then we the other So the other one that we just submitted yesterday is for this um, collaboration that we're doing with Emoka. And so again, um, that's not cre creating a project. We would do that anyway. Right. Um, the difference is, is that if we don't get the grant, the exhibit's gonna be like this. If we do get the grant, the exhibit's gonna be like this. You know, so yeah. it just expands what we're able to do. Yeah. Um, let me think about it. Seems like there's one more that I can get. I forget. <laughs> I but yeah, I'm trying not to create work for us. <laughs> That's the challenge. It really is with these grants, and it's so interesting to me because it's kind of, I mean, of course it's a it's a blessing and a curse because there's a lot of money available right now but it's all one-time dollars. So it's really difficult to build something and sustain something with this money. Um, so yeah, it's it's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I'm finding the same thing with the Humane Society. Yeah. Like, we have innovation grants. I'm like, I don't want to innovate. I want to pay my staff. Right, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and, and it just doesn't seem to me that the you know each and every one of these has different slightly different guidelines and slightly different focus but none of them in my opinion actually get to the heart of the problem which is you know all of these organizations lost a lot of money during the course of the pandemic and they are really struggling to to keep going and so they do basically ask me to create the program. That's what happened with the NEH grant that Eric worked on, is that we had to hire somebody specifically for digital programming, um, and then essentially create the programs, you know? So it was great, because we never would have been able to do 
the virtual programming that we did without that. But at the same time, we were tapped, you know, we were exhausted. So it was hard. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for asking that question. Those are good details. Anything else? Eric's going to give us a tour of the facility if you're interested in that. Do we have anything else on the agenda? Do we have any old business or new business? Is it not any old comments? Just so I'm glad we're getting to see this facility now. So thank you for inviting us. <laughs> this is exciting. Yeah, we opened we opened the building and couldn't invite anybody to it because the toilets didn't work. <laughs> and then a pandemic hit. So <laughs> So finally we invite you to our brand new two-year-old building. <laughs> Well, do you want to have a motion to adjourn? Let's have a motion to adjourn. Okay, I'm going to use your I'm going to adjourn. Awesome. Yeah.